we are good to go it is the top of the hour hello and welcome today we are going to look have an intro session we're looking at the much anticipated and recently released affinity photo for ipad i have only got you will be no doubt glad to hear a handful of slides but that it's critical information that you need but before we go on if you don't know me i'm elaine giles longtime trainer podcast host and inveterate geek love new software and this one is no exception so back to Affinity for iPad. I told you there wasn't much about me. This session, I, I think we advertised it about 10 days ago. And I've been doing sessions online for the last 15, 16 years. This one, I've had more feedback about this session than any other. So you guys love the idea of editing your photos on the iPad. And I can understand your excitement. Why Affinity Photo? Well, there's lots to love. So what I want you to do is to tell me in the chat why you love Affinity Photo if you're already using it. Or if you're not, why are you thinking of using it? Are you trying to replace something? Is it something that's completely new to you? Just let me know in the chat and then I'll have a good idea of where we're at. Now, I love Affinity. Um, Affinity is a suite of applications from Serif Software. Now, I used to use their Windows software back in the day, and I mean back in the day, early 90s. And um, I was so amazed when they brought this out for Mac. So within a, a few short years, they've actually redefined how we think about creative design software. Me in particular, can't wait for it, honestly. Affinity Designer was the first application that was released for the Mac and that followed with Affinity Photo for the Mac. Then they released Windows versions and I bought them. I know that's really unusual. I do actually own a PC, I, I'm ashamed to admit. But I bought them for the once in a year occasion I'm forced to use Windows. And my excitement is mounting this year because I can't wait to get hold of Publisher. I have clients who are using Microsoft Publisher, yes, still. And um, I'm prying them away from it. And I'm not having much luck because they don't want to go to um, big heavy things like InDesign but they need a little bit more power. So hopefully Publisher will be with us in beta at least this year. Now, other reasons why Affinity is so popular. The number one reason that people give me when I ask them what they like about it is there's no recurring monthly fee. And that is true of the Mac version, the Windows version and the iOS version. As I said, my current Creative Cloud subscription is eye-wateringly expensive and increasingly underused as I turn to Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo for the majority of what I do. I was talking pre-show and saying that despite the fact I've got my subscription, I haven't actually had Photoshop installed or Illustrator for the last two months and I have not missed them. When I want to edit Photoshop files, I open them up in Affinity Photo. And when I want to edit Illustrator files, I open them up in Affinity Designer. And I really haven't missed it. Then, of course, we recorded a new podcast and I needed the audio editing. And they're not doing audio editing yet, but who knows? Maybe they'll surprise us one day. I'm also in the process of transitioning from Sketch, um, from Bohemian Coding to Affinity Designer. And actually, I've already done that. The last thing I've got to do is just convert my existing Sketch files and then I'm done. The other thing is there's a huge range of features in these uh, applications from Serif. They're comparable with what you've doubtless used in any other applications. And I know in the chat we've talked about Photoshop, we've talked about Photoshop Elements, uh, Acorn, Pixelmator. You are going to instantly feel at home in the Affinity apps if you've used anything like that. Another thing people tell me is the speed of the applications. On my previous Mac, which I'll admit it wasn't too well, hard drive wasn't too well, I'd actually stopped opening other design apps because by the time they were ready to use, I'd honestly forgotten what I'd opened them to do in the first place. And it wasn't unusual for, and I don't like to keep saying Photoshop, but Photoshop to take two minutes to open. And that was on a pretty high power spec. My new iMac's considerably faster, but I don't think I should need 64 gig of RAM and an i7 to edit a small JPEG. And that was really what it had come to. Another reason is the huge range of file formats that are supported, and that does include Photoshop files. And I'll show you opening a Photoshop file tonight. And now it's available on the iPad. And because it's available on the iPad, that means on the, the iPad, there's support for your Apple Pencil. It's like a Wacom Cintiq, if you've ever seen one of those on steroids. I love my Apple Pencil to start with. I use it every day. But once I started editing photos with it, just amazing. Now, last thing to think about before we go into the demo, because I know you want to see it, you want to see what it can do, is to think about what you're going to need to make this work on your iPad. 
and you will need a minimum of an iPad Air 2. That includes the iPad that was released earlier this year that's not the Pro model, so an iPad 2017 version 5. That's the one that doesn't support the pencil and I do believe it is a little bit cheaper. It's also supported on the iPad Pro 9.7 inch, the 10.5 inch and the 12.9 inch. Tonight I'm going to be demoing it on a 12.9 inch. There is very little difference between the 12.9 and the 10.5. Now, people have said, well, why? Because I've got an iPad Air 1 and I'm not pleased. Well, as I've said, the things that are critical for this is that you're going to need the minimum of a 9.7 inch screen. So if you're running an iPad mini, although it's an iPad, it is not going to run this. It needs that minimum screen size. Well, I think when you see it, you'll realize why. The other thing it needs is a 64-bit processor. So older kit just doesn't have that. And that's why it only runs on the list that I've given you. And the third thing is metal. It needs Apple metal. If you're unaware of what metal is, it's the magic that makes your iPad work in the graphics department. Um, I looked up precisely what it was so I could tell you. And it said it was a low level, low overhead hardware accelerated graphics and compute application programming interface. So, like I said, it's the magic that makes your iPad work. That's all we need to know about it. Now, I've had many mails from you since we opened up bookings for this um, requesting specific demos. So I hope that I've selected a good range to show you, um, really just to show you how versatile Affinity Photo for iPad is. That's what I've gone for. But I've also gone for the demonstrations that people have seen before that I've done in desktop quality applications. And what you want and what you've been telling me is, can I do this on an iPad now? So that's that was my remit. So let's go and have a look at it. So seamlessly into my iPad, I hope. And according to my screen, everything's fine. So I will carry on. So as I said, this is um, an iPad 12.9 inch. It's brand new. So it is a new one. I've gone for black this time. I went for white previously, but black this time and all I've installed on here is down in the bottom right hand corner photo not done anything else other than login that's it so I'm going to tap in there and go into it right this is the welcome screen and this is your starting point this is uh, your jump off point now you can access here you can start from scratch and make a new um image completely. So that's up in the top left hand corner, new document. That will give you, that's the equivalent of saying file new on your desktop. Next to that, you've got import from cloud. So what I'm going to do here is uh, just do some magic and hopefully this will work. I love doing magic and then it doesn't work. There we go. So we looked at new document. So this red dot is going to follow us now. So you can see what I'm talking about. We've got import from cloud. That will access the materials that you have in iCloud. Now, I've not been the world's biggest fan of iCloud, as anybody who listens to MacBytes will know. However, it's been working rather well. So having said that, it'll probably crash and burn on me tonight, but that's what it's talking about. Then you can import from photos. There's been a bit of a debate as to whether you can work with raw images from photos. I have got a few links that I can pop in the chat and provide you with later that explains what's going on with um, raw images from photos. But I know that this is something that um, Serif are working on. So if it's not working for you at the moment, there is hope that it will do shortly. You can also create new panoramas. So you can merge images together and create panoramas from them. You can create new image stacks. You can, fo you can use focus merge down in the lower left. You can have HDR merge. You can even import from the camera, which will enable you to bring in images live, as it were. I might try that later just for a laugh. And because you know, you've now seen my desk, my desk is um, complicated tonight. I might, after we've finished, try and take a picture of it and show it, show, show it you um, in terms of moving this around all the cables that I've got. And finally, you can create a new project. So this, as I say, is your welcome screen. Now, what I'd be looking at doing is going through some demonstrations. So I need to import some images from the cloud. That's my starting point. Uh, and what I'm going to do first is work on some raw images. So I need to import from the cloud. So this is what I'm going to do. So the red dot's going to disappear now out of the way. And uh, my hand's going to come into play as I tap like a manic woodpecker with my pencil. So I'm going to go into there. That brings up my iCloud drive. 
And as you can see, I've got a lot of folders in there because I have a lot of apps. But the one handily that we're interested in is the Affinity Photo one in the top left hand corner. And in there I have got Oh, lots of folders and files and all sorts of things. And there's things there that shouldn't be there, but never mind. Um, I have organised this in iCloud on my desktop. I created all of those folders, one each for the demonstrations tonight. And I've got some pictures that I have put um, on my, I think they're in my documents folder. And it says in iCloud Drive and I've got my documents uh, re going up to iCloud Drive. So that's probably why. So there's a few images that I've um, put on social media. That's what they are. But the folders are where it's at today. And the first thing I'm going to do is look at processing some raw images. So I'm going to tap on the raw folder over on the right hand side. And what I've got in there is four images. Some of them have already been processed. They've been processed elsewhere. But they are two Canon raw files, CR2s, and two DNGs. That is Adobe Digital Negative Format files. So they are actually in the cloud at the moment. What I'm looking to do is um, download it to this iPad and start working on it. So I'm going to start with the one on the left, which is the um, it was a picture of the London skyline. And I swear when I took it, it didn't look as murky as that. But obviously it was a raw image, so we can work on it. We can do something with that. So because it's a raw file, it opens up in the interface. And I will talk more about the interface when, when we can see more. But this is what would happen to you if you opened up a raw file in Affinity Photo for iPad. You'll be taken to what's called the develop persona. Now, a persona is just a collection of tools that will help you get a job done, a specific job. It will take away tools that are completely irrelevant in this circumstance, and it will show you tools that are very relevant. So in this circumstance, it's raw. We need all those exposure controls, the enhancement controls. And on the left hand side, you have tools which are also relevant. So if this image was of a person and it had red eye, there is red eye removal in there. I can put gradients on from there and I can crop images from there. But it's really the right hand side that's relevant when you're working with raw images. So I'm just going to show you what you've actually got here. That image was completely untouched out of the camera. I'm going to make it a lot lighter by sliding across on that top slider. And you can see it, it was the, the um, I think we we're in the top, uh, the top floor of a hotel. And I thought, yeah, that looks great. But now I've seen the top of it, maybe not with that air conditioning. But if I take it all the way, you can see exactly what that would have looked like in much lighter daylight. And I'm just going to go through these and expose this image in the way that I would like to see it. So I'm going to take that down so it's much, much darker because I want the foreground to kind of blend away, really. I want that much, much darker. So take it right down over there. I'm then going to change the black point. If I slide that across to the right, it changes the black point. So again, it, it goes darker. I don't want it completely black, though. So somewhere like there gives me a little bit of wiggle room. Having done that, something has happened in the top right hand corner of the image. So I'm just going to show you that you can zoom in and look at that. That's either dust on the sensor or my lens was dirty. Not sure which, but there's definitely something there. That is actually something you can do something about in here. But what I'm going to do is uh, go back by double tapping and that will take it back to um, full screen view and I will sort that out shortly. You can fix it in here or you can take it into Affinity and fix it later. So it's completely up to you. So moving through what we've got here, we've also got brightness. So I'm going to slide that to the right. Again, you can see it brightens it up and taking it down to the left darkens it down. I don't particularly want it that dark. I just want the black bits to be very black. So I want the black point to be quite across to the left, uh, no, to the right there. So it's um, sort, of, sort of dark at the bottom. That's what I want. Then I want to add a little bit of clarity to it. So take the clarity up a little bit. Now, I do want to change the colour of this image greatly because it didn't look like that when I took it. Honest, it didn't. So the saturation of the colours and the vibrance of the colours and the actual balance of the colours is where I want to concentrate most work on this. So I want to saturate it and let's take it. That's the desaturation and that's saturating it. So I want the colours to be a lot more vibrant than they are. I'm going to take those up a bit. I'm also going to take the vibrance up a bit. And you can see what's happening. It's really affecting the colours there. Now, I would like that sky to be the blue that I remember. 
So to do that, I can adjust the temperature of that. I only have to move that such a fraction. You can just see my pencil in shot there and it's just a fraction and it makes a huge, huge difference. And with the tint, I can do the same. I can tint it so it's more green or it's going over to the red side. Now, actually, I don't think that needs much in the way of a tint. It was the blue that I wanted to bring out into it. And now I can scroll up and get to the rest of them, which is the shadows and the highlights. So again, if I take that down over there with the highlights, I'm taking those down, go across the other way and it does the alternative. I don't really need to make too many changes with those. With the shadows, I don't want much in the way of shadows in there. So I'm going to take that out. That doesn't look too bad. What I was concerned about here was the blue. I wanted that sky to be much bluer. So I'm going to take up the saturation even more, an obscene amount of saturation, because in my mind, that's what I saw. So I've developed that there. Now, what I can do, and this is brilliant, I love to use this feature. At the bottom of the screen, there is a split option. You've only got three options. You can develop it now, you can discard the changes, or you can view the split. And viewing the split means showing you what the before and after look like. And you can actually slide that left to right. So you take it all the way across. It was a bit washed out. It was a lot washed out. And now that's much more like I remember it. So you can get to see the before and the after. I think that is a fantastic feature. What I can't, even with my video here, my video camera, get across to you is just how smooth that is. But you can see I'm not, it's not stopping in any way. It's very, very, very smooth. Very smooth. In fact, it, it's what the Tim Cook brigade call buttery smooth. It is very smooth indeed. So I'm just going to tap develop now and that will develop the image and it will take it off into Affinity Photo. Now we've gone out of develop mode. We are now in a completely different mode. The mode we are now in is the photo mode. So the, the, um, the default mode really, the default persona. And these personas are up in the top left hand corner. They are there. So I've just put the red dot underneath it. This is the first one that we're in now. Then you've got the selection persona, the liquify persona, and you've got these others as well. So if I just tap on these, I'm just going to take you through them and you can see what you've actually got. The tools change as I move. So there's the selection tools in the selection persona. There is the liquify persona. And we get to this one here. That one is your um, developed persona that we've just been into. But you can use this on JPEGs as well as raw files. And then at the end, this is your tone map persona. So it's making it into a tone map there. And yeah, it, well, it's changed it, hasn't it? Let's le just leave it at that. It's changed it, uh, posterized it somewhat. But I'm going to cancel out of that. We don't want that. So I'm going to go back to the default view and I'm going to double tap to go full screen with that. Right. So within this view, this is where you will spend a lot of your time. You have the tools down the left hand side. So you've got the hand tool, the move tool um, or the crop tool, the fill tool, the gradient tool, all kinds of tools that you are used to all down the left hand side there. Some of them have little disclosure triangles on them. So the top one does. And these in the midpoint here have disclosure triangles. That indicates that the tool has more tools hidden underneath it. So if I just choose that hand tool and tap on it once, you can see it's the view tool and the rotate canvas tool. And then tap again to hide that. If the tool you're looking for the extra tools under isn't selected, so let's say these down the bottom, the stamp tool, it's once to select the tool that is displayed and tap once more to see the other tools that are hidden underneath it. So it's very, very simple to use. So I'm just gonna go back to the hand for the default, right. Over on the other side, over on the right hand side, you have got um, studios. These are collections of tools that do specific jobs. So if we start at the top, there is the layers studio. This is where you work with all the layers. The next one is colors. And as you go through all of these, these are your brushes. These are your adjustments. You've got access to filters. You've got effects that you can apply. You've got text. You've got all sorts in here, every tool that you will no doubt have seen in the desktop version. If you have used that, they have done an amazing job of making this very similar to the desktop version in terms of feature parity. It's completely amazing what they've done. So we were developing this. And the last thing that I needed to do, I didn't sort out um, my error at the top, did I? My, my dirt on the sensor. But what I need to do with this to finish it off is to crop it. So I'm going to get the crop tool. 
I want it to be constrained, so I want it to be the same ratio, but I want to use this building on the left hand side. I just want to focus in on the BT tower. So I'm going to tap on unconstrained and choose original ratio. And from there, I can just drag this in, making sure I've got rid of that building and that looks pretty good there. Once I've done that, I just need to tap the plus at the, the tick at the bottom and that crops me and out I go. So that's the first process of this raw image. So I'm going to go back to the welcome screen and that has now added itself to here. This is the file manager that you've got on this welcome screen and it's added that image to it. Now I just want to show you that in terms of processing your raw images, there's nothing to stop you going and doing it again. So I'm going to import from the cloud. I'm going to go back and get exactly the same image which was in my raw folder. But this time I'm going to develop it in a completely different way, more like the one next to it, to be honest. I'm going to aim for much warmer this time. So in here I need to change my black point. So I want to lose some of that. I'll make the exposure slightly less. You can add a bit of contrast into it. I do want to saturate it. I do want to add a lot of vibrance to it but I also want to warm it up a lot. So instead of this end where we're down in the blues, I want to take it over to this side and go very orange, very orange indeed. Nuclear winterish orange. But let's pretend this is the morning. We've got a beautiful sunrise. OK, so that's all I really want to do with that. Um, but I will show you that I can do something with this up here where I have sensor dust. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see that, but it's noticeable here. And what I'm going to do is use this blemish removal and I am going to tap on there. I'm going to make that much bigger. And what I have there is somewhere I'm taking it from and somewhere I'm covering up. So what I'm doing there is that actually seems to have got rid of it. So uh, I've covered it up with this bit here, put that over the top of it and that's pretty much got rid of it. So I'm happy with that. What I can do then is develop that and take it back into the main affinity window. It even retains your zoom level. So I'm going to double tap to take that up to full screen, go back into my crop and crop that exactly the same as I did the other one. But I've got an image uh, in raw that I have processed in two completely different ways. And that one, I even fixed the dirt on the sensor as well. So that's how you work with raw in it. And it is amazingly powerful. It's very smooth to work with. There's no lag on it at all. OK, have we got any questions so far on raw? Anybody got any questions on that? Because I can't I can't see the chat. It's behind another window I've got. Oh, we've got a few questions, have we? Uh, go on, read me a question. Storm says, will you be covering sharing files with a Mac version or drive file? Yes, I will be showing how to um, take these files that are in Affinity Photo for iPad and get them back to your desktop. Yep, I can do that. Gaz says, do these tools put the tools in any order of priority on usage and impact on the image? No, not really. You can you can play around. You don't have to do it in a particular order. When I'm um, exposing raw images, I do tend to work through from the top down and make um, because if I make a change sort of three quarters of the way down and then I go back to the top, I might need to go back to three quarters of the way down and change that because they all impact each other. Basically, I would advise you to come up with a workflow for raw that works for you. So I tend to go through a five step process. I think I've written up something about that. I will find a link for you and um, send it out after the event. But yeah, I follow a, a, a set pattern of how I develop an image. Darren says, can we have a little review of the studios at the end of the seminar? Can we have a little review of the studios? You absolutely can. We'll be using those studios as we go through it for various things. Um, but yes, we can absolutely go over that at the end. I should have mentioned at the beginning that these sessions, we, we book them in for an hour, an hour and a quarter. But I'm happy to stay around for quite a while having a chat with you and answering questions you've got. And if you want to see something extra, that's absolutely fine. So, yeah, no problem with that at all. And Storm says, good time to hit the question mark button to show all the tool tips. Yep, it is. OK, right. I'll do that. I'll go back into one of these images uh, and show you that in the lower, oh, you can't see that on the camera. Oh, let's move the camera down a bit. There you go. Down there, that bit there. All right. Um, if I tap that. There we go. Tap and hold that and it brings up an overlay which shows you what everything does. Amazing. Amazing. Um, if you let go, disappears. But if you're just not sure, 
over on the right hand side which of those is which and you find yourself tapping and tapping and tapping um if you just tap and hold that it will show you what everything is all of these studio panels that you have available and all of the tools on the left hand side as well i would say the tools on the left hand side are going to be more familiar to you than the ones on the right um, because when you're on the mac version you will find there that um they tend to have a title and you can follow them. Whereas in here, it's just a little icon, so you can't. We don't really have the screen real estate to have text showing, but that's a way to do it. So absolutely, you can do that. OK, so keep putting your questions in. I'll uh, stop whenever and get back to them. So what was the next thing I was going to show you? Let's have a look. Uh, right. I had got an image and a lot of you had asked about this image of an owl. Now I have my owl image, which is back in here in a folder called owl, helpfully. It's just a JPEG. Um, it's an image that uh, it was a stock image and I was looking for an owl for something and I looked at it and I thought it was a great picture of an owl, but phew, the colour's not great. Now, what I'm going to do with this one is show you some adjustments. And these adjustments, because of the way the studios work, are completely non-destructive. So that's my owl. Uh, he's not great, bless him. It's a good photo, but... Uh, what we need to do is to go across. So let me just tap and hold that and show you it's the Adjustments Studio, which is the fifth one down on the right hand side. We're looking at the Adjustments Studio. So I'm going to tap up there and you'll see that sometimes I'm tapping with my finger and sometimes I'm tapping with a pencil. It's just really what makes sense. And in here, obviously, I could scroll. Uh, let me just show it. I could scroll with the pencil, but I tend not to. I tend to move the pencil and scroll with my finger when I'm scrolling and tap with the pencil. OK, the brightness and contrast is the one I'm looking for. But actually in here, you have a lot of adjustments. So you can do your colour balances or you can go crazy with gradient maps and all kinds of things. But this one's relatively simple to improve this image greatly uh, is relatively simple. You can actually see the thumbnail preview that already that's looking better and I haven't actually done anything yet. So I'm going to tap on there. And that gives me the tools at the bottom of the screen here, along the bottom edge, where I can change the brightness and the contrast. So how I do that is to move across to the right or across to the left. OK, I tried going up and down with that and it sort of worked. But obviously, as I'm going down, I run out of iPad. So I, I would suggest that you go to the right and the left with that. Um, brightness wise, it doesn't really need too much in the way of brightness. But I noticed as I was adding brightness that the background started to look, look less liney. So I did add a little bit of brightness to it. I can tell from looking at that that it must have been at a zoo. And what that haze is that's over it, that's making it look kind of misty, is doubtless a fence that's out of focus. Because I've done that myself with pictures of tigers and ended up with what looks like um, a net voil over the top of them. So that's probably what it is. But if we move over to the contrast, now this time, instead of uh, tapping and, and dragging one way or the other, I just tapped. And if you just tap, you get this little calculator. So you could just add 25 to it if you wanted and see what that looked like. Or you can go back in and you can add 75 to it. It's starting to look much better. You can also go in there um, and actually type it in. So if you specifically wanted 74, you could do that too. Although that added, oh no, 74 it did. There we go. So not looking too bad. I actually think now the brightness isn't helping this. I need to take that down just a little or I need to take contrast up. Let's have a look. What looks better with that? He's starting to look better, I think. So in there, I've added 29 and 78. Mm, do I need a little bit more on the brightness? Possibly a little bit more on the brightness. There we go. So what I'm going to do with that now if you're working with an image, and obviously I've got a portrait image here, but if you're working landscape and you can't see that side, you can also uh, fold that down over there. I've actually tapped the wrong one. I was in there, but you can actually tap again. It will leave the tools at the bottom for you to work with, but it will hide the studio on the right hand side. OK, that's not looking too bad at all, is it? Doing quite nicely there. So uh, I'm going to name that. Uh, no, actually, that's a preset, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to name it there. I am going to go back into here and show you that you now have a layer and it's very, very tiny. Let me get that up. Let's see if we can uh, zoom in on that somehow. Let me. Where am I? That's it. OK, let me bring that over so we can hopefully see it. It says brightness stroke contrast adjustment. But it's an unnamed layer, so it tells you what it is, but it's actually an unnamed layer. So that's what we've got over there. 
So let's get rid of that and get back to that because I need. Uh... Oh, where have you gone? I love it when I do things and and, and things th things happen. It's off screen. You don't need to worry about it. Okay, so. I've done the owl. So what I can now do with these layers is actually tap the tick to turn them on and off. So I can see the before and I can see the after there. Now, th this owl, I could take it to extremes. I could really go to extremes with this owl. What I could do is um, I could duplicate that layer. Now, I couldn't help but think I should go in here to duplicate, which is all the layer properties. But no, it's not in there. But making sure that I've got the layer selected, which I have, if I go across to the left hand side, I have two menu buttons. There are two menus up there. There is the first one, which is the document menu. This is all the things to do with the document. And what I'm trying to do in terms of copy a layer, that's not to do with the document. So I need the next one, which is the document one. And the very top option is duplicate. And just hitting that duplicate, we now have nuclear winter, the owl, because I've duplicated the adjustment that I've made. So I now have two copies of it. So turn one off and the second one off. They are actually identical, but I'm just showing you that you can actually duplicate that. And that is how you handle duplicating the layers. OK. I'm seeing, uh, what was the last thing that was put in the chat? Because I'm seeing, I remember the owl. That's the last thing that I've got typed in there. Is everybody following along and not, not typing? Is that what's happening? Okay, so that was a very simple adjustment. And just to show you that because it put it on a separate layer, it's completely non-destructive. So that is how you work with your adjustments. And don't forget, as I'm going through this and I'm doing all this, um, I'm actually downloading these live from the cloud because this was a completely clean install of Affinity Photo. I have another iPad that I've been prepping on, but this one, it was completely new install of it. OK, I've got a question. Is how accurate do you think the iPad is for showing the adjustments when the image is printed or shown on other devices? Um, I'd say it's pretty accurate. You are going to have to calibrate if colour is um, that critical to you. The reason that, I mean, I make an image look all right on my um my Mac or my iPad. And then what I would do is take it and have it printed. I've gone through the process of having my own printers and printers are spawn of the devil when it comes to tech. They work when they feel like it. So what I wanted to do was have it printed out professionally. And there's no point me calibrating my monitor to my screen and all the rest of it, you know, this to that, because I'm then going to take it somewhere that I can't calibrate it to. So I pretty much take send it to print or take it to be printed and then bring that back and have a look at it and make decisions based on that so i i do it like a test first i would say it is fairly accurate okay uh, am i all right with questions there am i okay okay right all right let's get on to the next one then which is one that i particularly like the look of because i thought it'll never work oh and spoiler it did it was okay so i'm going back to import from the cloud again um, back to my Affinity photo folder. And I have this image, which is, why is it a Photoshop file? She said, worried, because it's a hundred and odd meg and it wasn't when I put it up there, but never mind. Oh, let's try it. Let's see if it really is a Photoshop file with lots and lots of layers in it. Okay, so what's happening is I've tapped on that. It's downloading it. As I say, it's coming down from iCloud and I am doing all kinds of things here with my tech absolutely all kinds of things uh, in terms of broadcasting to YouTube, etc. So it will take a little bit of time because I stupidly use the Photoshop file, but hopefully it will come down and I shouldn't ping my pen, my pencil either, should I? Hopefully it will come down. OK, uh, just looking for questions. Got no questions while this is thinking about it. Don't let me down because I've got this demo is a good one. I like this demo. So uh, come along, come along. 100 meg from iCloud. I should open a book on how long this is actually going to take. One thing I'd like to do in um, Affinity Photo is queue files to download to say, you know, download that. Now, that's the after that we've got here. What I'm going to do is lose that. That's the before image. That's what it would look like if I hadn't been fiddling in Photoshop. You should never fiddle in Photoshop. Right. It was an image that it's a good image, I like the image, but the cliffs over here are a little bit hazy. The sky's not bad, nice colours in it, but it's a little bit hazy. Now, what you've got in here, so let's tap and hold that again. You have here some filters. You can apply filters. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is go back in here. What have I done there? Right. What I'd done in Photoshop was a layers adjustment just to see how I could get it to look with a layers adjustment. What I'm actually going to do, though, is duplicate this. So I'm going to go back to my duplicate command exactly as I did before. This is going to be my original The background layer is going to be my reference layer. And this second one that's called background, that's the one I'm going to work on. So I can actually turn that off. Doesn't matter. And what I'm going to do with that is I want to apply some filters to it or, or a filter to it. These are all the filters that you have available. Not only can you scroll up and down here and again, it's very responsive, but you can also go left to right on the title at the top. So I'm not blurring this. I've got, I've got things to blur. This isn't one that I want to blur. And what I'm looking for in here as I scroll down, they're in alphabetical order, helpfully. I'm looking for haze removal, which is that one. So it analyzes the scene for me and makes some suggestions. So I'm going to take that out of the way so I can see my entire image. And I've got that slider again, my before and my after. So this is the before and this is the after. And what I was interested in, let's put it across the boat there, um, was making it, I wasn't concerned about bringing noise into it because I can fix that in other ways, okay? But what I can do here is re reduce that. I can go all the way over to 100%, which I have done, which is the distance. So that is from foreground to background. How far into the distance do you want this to go? And I want the whole thing to be haze removed. But it could be that you've got an image maybe in the mountains somewhere and you'd like the foreground to be a little bit clearer, but not the background. So you just wouldn't take it the full distance. Then you've got the strength of the effect. So as I take that up, it takes that effect away. And as I go all the way down to 200, we start to see horrific posterization there. Horrific in all kinds of noise in it. There are ways that you can work with this and reduce that. But I'm showing you this just to show you the haze removal. And I think 200 is way too much for that. So I want to dial it back a little bit. So I've got a huge change that you can see, but not too much in the way of posterization. So if we look at the church up there and we don't worry about the posterization and just see the before and the after, there is an, a huge difference there. So again, double tap to get back to the full screen. And there we go. Very, very simple to remove that kind of haze it with it. And that's it. You're done. All you need to do then is hit the tick and it's applied. So if I go back into my layers, and I've got my uh, there. If I turn off that one, that was what we started with. And that was what the haze removal managed to do. So if you think about the workflow of being on an iPad, obviously you're out. You're working on your iPad. You're out. You can do the most amazing things that you've just not been able to do before on a mobile device. Right. But my most I had two features that were requested like crazy. They were the ones that you wanted to see. One was repairing images and the other was making selections. The holy grail of digital image editing, making selections that work. So let's have a look at some of those because these are fantastic. OK, so going back in, getting another image. These are coming down live, as you've seen. I must be crazy. OK, we are looking for a very simple one to start with which is a poor child who has measles. There we go. She's got a fantastic smile and measles. Right. But we're going to fix that. Now, I have preferences. There are lots of um, tools that you can use to start fixing, fixing images. So the first thing I'm going to do is to make these image edits non-destructive because I maybe want to go back and compare how I'm doing um, before. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to get myself a new blank layer. I have two options when it comes to layers. There are new pixel layers and new fill layers. And I'm interested in a pixel layer. So that's the layer that I've got put, putting above this. That's the one I'm going to put the repairs on. And my preference for working with images like this is to use the in painting tool. But you have a whole collection here. I'm just going to tap on that so you can see them. You've got the clone brush, the healing brush, the patch tool, the blemish removal, the in-painting brush and the red eye removal. So you've got all these different types of tools and each one's best for, for a different job. For me, I prefer the in-painting brush, I must admit. I absolutely love the in-painting brush. That's the one I'm going to use. So I'm going to tap on the in-painting brush, which gives me my brush. Now, most of the time you can just start painting away. 
But I don't do that. And I don't recommend that you do that. Because if you do, it's going to make changes to the current layer, which is why I have made an extra layer. So I'm going to do this on three different images because this is the demo that you wanted to see. You assured me. So I'm going to go through the same process of making a new blank layer. And then in my source at the bottom of the screen, I need to tap. And instead of choosing the current layer, I need to choose current layers and below. Because my current layer is blank, it's empty. So if I start painting with empty pixels, nothing's going to happen. And I can't tell you the number of times that I do that because I wish there was a way to make a default. So it always says current layer and below and never current layer. But there you go. That's what I would like. Right. I then have five things that I can do here. I can alter the width of my brush, my brush being what is on here. There you go. As I do that, it's going to start repairing it. Now, I didn't want that. So I'm going to tap that undo and undo that. Only once, not twice. Don't want to lose the layer. I can change the hardness and I can change the opacity and the flow. Right. So really with trial and error with that, to be honest, in terms of this little bit here, which is um, I will zoom in that bit there. I can have quite a soft brush on that. The softer the brush, the better really to fix it. So all I'm going to do is just draw over that and it's that's it. It's gone. When I get to the hairline or around the eyebrow, I might need to adjust the hardness somewhat because I don't want to make it look murky. But it really is trial and error. I may find that that's a little bit big as well. So I might decide to take that down a little bit, just enough so it covers that. Just I'm barely touching with this with the pencil and it's fixing itself. I can't tell you how difficult this used to be. And now it's really simple. I've got a few just dust there on the lens by the look of it. I'll go over that one. And this was what I was meaning about the hair. That one's actually under the hair. So if I just do that within the hair, it fixes it. But if I've got one that's kind of half and half, I may need to change that brush slightly. But at the moment, it's going well, so I'm going to leave it alone. If it's not broken, I'm leaving it alone. Now, one thing I do need to tell you, and if you're watching on the camera, you'll see that I'm actually using two fingers here to move around, to zoom in and to zoom out. I'm using two. If I have the hand tool selected there, I only need to use one. But if I try doing it with my um, inpainting tool, it will inpaint if I use one. So that's why I'm using two to move it around. I actually find I'm getting into the habit of using two and be done with it. So just go over that bit there. This is like magic. It really is amazing. It's taking very little effort on my part. And when I say effort, I mean actually thinking about how to do it. What would be the best way to do it? And I've actually got one on her eye there, which is going to be pretty tricky. So what I'm going to do is make the brush much smaller and just go over that there. And that covers it in just enough. There we go. And you see what happened there? You should have seen a little red flash come across. I It didn't take my two fingers. I needed to get to use two fingers to do that. And there was one last bit down here that's a, a scratch as well. Somebody's been scratching. I remember I did that when I had measles. Didn't please my mother. Right, there we go. You'll be scarred for life, I got told. Uh, right, make that a little bit smaller. Now, with the in-painting tool that I much prefer, I tend to do it in little steps, little increments. I have tried to do it on images that have huge things to be removed. And sometimes it copes better than others. So it's a case of going through doing it if you're not happy with it, undoing and then going back and doing it again. You can use exactly the same technique for little bits of dust like this on clothes. And I'm, I'm not changing these options at the bottom much at all. I'm just literally tap, tap, tap. Anybody could do this. This takes no skill at all. So there we go. There's our girl. Double click, uh, double tap rather, turn off the repairs, which are on a separate layer, turn on the repairs. And we've done a pretty good job there. But I know what you're going to tell me. That's all very well, but that's simple. <laughs> yes, I know. Let's try something trickier. Images like that were made for demos. But the other day, this is a real image. This is a real image that was just a throwaway shot that was taken um, for reasons other than doing a demo with, which was my iMac arrived, which meant the UPS van arrived. And outside my house, very helpfully, the council, not very helpfully, keep putting lamp posts and other kinds of rubbish, including this thing that looks as though it would look more at home on um, 
Doctor Who. It's actually a street lamp. I'm assured it's a street lamp, but it's in the way. Now, the reason I'm showing you this image is this was just a throwaway image um, of the UPS van outside my house. So it wasn't staged in any way. And I thought this would be a great one to try and remove the stuff that's in the way. So let's try doing that because there's nothing worse, is there, in a demo? You look at these images and you think, yeah, that's fine. They work on those. They're sanitized. No, this one's not sanitized. This was just a rough image with my iPad. So what I'm going to do is exactly what you see me do before. Go in and create a new pixel layer to put the repairs on. Go back and get the in painting brush because I love the in painting brush and make sure that I'm pasting from the current layer and below. There we go. That's what I need to do. And I need to see what size this is. That's a little bit too small. And what I'm going to do is literally just paste over this, just paint over the top of it. So we'll get rid of that at the top and move down there. I'm giving it enough. I stopped there. That's why that happened. Let's go down there a bit more. I'm going over it so it's got a little bit of the edge because the trick with this is it's what you select. And as you can see, as I'm letting go, it's doing a marvellous job here. So let's get that last bit. My wrist rejection going a bit shonky here. There we go. Uh, I'm probably having issues with the wrist rejection. I've not had any problems with that. I told you I'm trying to keep this on the desk so you can see it in this camera, which means I can't pick it up and do things the way I would normally do them. But there you go. That is pretty good. We can't tell that was there now. And I can go through and I can do little repairs like that. Just get rid of the little bits of trees there. Get rid of those. Oh, we can sanitize this crazily. Right, let's go out there. That's looking pretty good. Oh, should we try and get rid of that bit? Uh, people shouldn't have uh, bushes that are too big, in my opinion. So let's get rid of them. Oh, let's do that. And there we go. Get rid of that. Not the best repair I've ever done on that, but. And we've got that little bit there as well. So I could do that. Um, where's my hardness? I'm going to take my hardness up a little bit because I don't want it to start getting muddy at the edges. So I'm just going to go around that. Again, there isn't one of you here watching this now who couldn't do this. This takes no skill whatsoever. And away it's gone. Fantastic. Of course, if you're like me, perfectionist, we've got that lamppost that's in the way. Mm, it's rather a big lamppost. It's in the colours of the UPS van. You'll notice band at the bottom. Very good of them. But still, it's in the way. It really cuts that image right in half. The problem you've got with that image is losing it from the top. Simple because we've already done that over the top. Getting rid of it from the top shouldn't be a major issue because the sky's behind it and there's lots of sky for it to have a look at and use to fill in the gaps. So let's just try. Can you get rid of that? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. The problem's going to be when we get down to the van because we never knew what the van looked like behind the lamppost. We can make a guesstimate with the sky, but not that. So let's take it down and get it to the top of the van. Half a lamppost better than no lamppost. There we go. So not doing too badly at all, but we would like the rest of the lamppost got rid of. Well, I would. So I'm going to go in there, just painting over it, but over the edge, slightly over the edge. Give it a chance to work its magic and see what it does. Not too bad at all. There's a couple of issues which I will fix. And then I need to take away the rest of it. So I'm going to do try and do that all in one go. Which is ambitious because it's taken a lot of processing power. Let's see what you can do with that. Fantastic. Now, the image, the, the bit that's not right is that it's got some rivets on here. Can easily get rid of that one. But the reason it's got the rivets is because it's used the bit to the right of it to in paint with. But all I've got to do is go over the top of it, lose the little white dots on it. Take it out. Lamppost has gone. If I turn the layer on and off now, lamppost was there. Lamppost has gone. And you literally do not know it was ever there. I went a little bit further. I, I got crazy. I thought, look at the state of their roof. Can I fix their roof for them? And uh, actually, it wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that difficult. If only it was this easy to do and this cheap. You don't need a roofer. There we go fix the roof. I also decided one satellite dish is more than enough for anybody. So let's lose the other one. And it whipped that away as well. So out. And that was the before. That was the after. This tidied it up a lot. If only it could cut my grass as well. 
which we won't talk about Mygrass. We're thinking of it as a wild garden at the moment. Now, OK, so that was two, but I said three. Let's go for broke. That one was impressive, but let's go for broke. So I'm going to import another one. This is the last one of these, but this is a beach swing. Where's my beach swing? This one is a stock image that I found and I looked at it and I thought, hmm, this is crying out to have that swing in the middle of it removed. I know it's the main feature of this image, but just as an example, could you possibly do that? So I'm going to do exactly the same again, which is get myself a new pixel layer. I am going to get my in-painting tool because I love my in-painting brush and I'm going to choose from all layers. What I'm looking to do is lose that swing. And seeing as though it is so big, it's so central, it's over so it's such an intricate background, I didn't think I was going to stand much, much chance at all. So I started at the top. This was the one, to be honest with you, um, I had the iPad upside down while I was drawing on it. So I've got to keep it flat on the table. Oh, no, I will do what I can with it. Because the image is so big, being a stock image, I'm going to do it in sections. Yes, I did lo lunacy. Uh, complete lunacy and try doing it in one go. I don't recommend that. So what I'm doing is giving it just enough around the edge that it can see a contrast. It needs a little bit selected so it can see the contrast. If you don't give it enough, you'll get ghosting, which you can get rid of. Uh, I haven't got any ghosting on that one, but if we work through and we see some ghosting, um, that's what it is, but you just need to go over it. You don't get ghosting if you give it enough pixels in the selection around the edge. So that's the trick with it. Don't just try like that to be very precise. Go a little bit wider on it and uh, it will make a better job with it. So you can see I've got a little bit left over that I just have to do that through. I'm going to try and get rid of everything now from here upwards, which is going to be tricky because uh, it's, it's a bit scraggy there, a little bit scraggy, but same principle holds good. Just draw around it uh, and give, give it enough pixels around the edges so it can uh, make that selection and make a good guesstimate as to what you would like it replaced with. And in this case, it's the sky background. So literally just drawing, drawing, drawing. This works just as well with your finger. I find it's easier for me with the pencil because I can actually see more of the screen. It's not obscured by my hand, which it would be if I was using my finger. Now that one's left a little bit of ghosting behind, as you can see, but all I need to do is just go in and just give it a couple of strokes across and it will disappear. And I, would, I went for two fingers, but it didn't like it. So I will give it two fingers if it doesn't start behaving. There we are. And just tidy that up there. There's a little bit of a dark patch there. So just do that. OK, going to get rid of the rest of that by taking that brush up a little bit just to make it quicker. Oh, I've got so many demos to show you and I only get a limited amount of time to show you. So let's go through and do this one. Let's get that down to there. Just leave the seat. And hopefully that will all go in one. Oh, no. Oh, it's crashed. OK. Ah, it is a bit of case. Of, can you tell what it is yet? OK, I'm going to go back in. I'm going to give it one more go. It is a difficult one. It is a difficult one. I said it was a difficult one. Uh, now, what I could have done, which I should have done, was I should have made my layer, my pixel layer. I should have gone in and got my tool. I should have got the right tool in painting. I should have done that got going with it. All right. So let's just very quickly. All right. Just do that. This is because I'm getting over ambitious with how much I'm trying to do in one go. If I did it, if I did it slower, if I did it in more passes, it would be easy. If I go out of that now, it will save it. So you can see it's saving in the top left hand corner. So then if I go back into it, if it do does crash, I'm not going to lose that. So that's that's just me uh, trying to do far too much, far too quickly. That's the problem with it. But I will give it one more go. So I'm just going to do this very quickly. I really should have one that I did earlier, shouldn't I? So you could see that. See how good it was. If it did it. Oh, it did it do it. Ah, two fingers. Come on. Oh, it is misbehaving on this one. I'll give it one last go. If it doesn't, I'm going to move on to a different demo. I'm going to come back to this one at the end. Because every time I go in, I've got to go and get my in-painting tool and then I've got to go and tell it. This is why I want the default to, to be reversed. I want to go and tell it to do something different. So let's go through here. I'm going very quick. I'm going far quicker than I would be if I was doing this for real because I'm mindful of time. But let's see if we can get rid of stuff. Do not crush on me. Don't you dare. OK, that's looking pretty good, isn't it? 
So it's really quite simple to get rid of the, um, the rope bits on here. That's not too tricky at all. Just give yourself enough room around the edges and don't crash. And don't crash. That's all you've got to do. There we go. Oh, that didn't crash. That was me. There we go. A little bit there. And oh, let's get rid of this bit. I'm going a little bit bigger. Let's get rid of that bit there. And as I say, if I did it in more passes, it would be absolutely fine. I wouldn't have a problem at all. It's just because I'm trying to get through it with the speed and fix these little patches over here. So what are we left with? We're left with the bit at the top, the bit at the side and the bit at the bottom. I'm going to try and do this one in two goes. I'm determined to get this done, aren't I? Look at the time. This is unbelievable. And I've got so many demos to show you that you would love. Tell me in the chat if you'd like me to go on for another 15 minutes, because we did schedule it for an hour and 15. I'm quite happy to stop at nine or I'm quite happy to carry on. Because this is amazing. You're going to love these demos. Right. Bye bye. There you go. Right. A little bit dirty smudges on that, which I will get rid of. That's really because it is such a complicated selection, this. The top bit is not too tricky. That will be in two bits. So I'll do that bit first. And get rid of that and that. And I know you guys, when you get hold of this, you'll be able to do a better job than me. I will put the link for this image, which is a stock photo, um, in the resources. I'll put it in the uh, YouTube description as well, and you can give it a go. Then you should send it to me and show me that you did a better job than I did. At which point I'm going to put a time limit on you and tell you you've got to do it faster. Because I'm trying to do it fast. <laughs> you all want me to carry on. Okay, I'll carry on. I've got a picture of my dog. Oh, my adorable little lad. And um, that, that's a great demo. That's a great demo. Okay. It's a looking a little bit smudgy. It wouldn't look that smudgy if, I, if I'd uh, taken more time on it. But let's see if we can get rid of this, this bit. I definitely did this in two little bits. I took that off first. Then I think I took the ropes off the bottom. And I wasn't particularly concerned about being overly precise with that. It's just covering the ropes up. It even put the little footprints in for me. Then I went and got that. Ah, oh, two fingers, two fingers. Come on. Mm, you painted red on there and you've left it red. What have you doing that, done that for? OK, I am upsetting this with the speed I'm going clearly. OK, you're going to do it for me. Ah, oh, he's left that red bit there. That'll spoil me fun, won't it? Oh dear, we're breaking it. Right, what I'm going to do is just quickly go over half of that. There you go. And finish it off. This was why I turned the iPad upside down and turned it on its side so I could just draw in a more natural way. I'm sort of a bit squashed up here trying to do it on a desk. But it's worth it so you can see it. There we go. So. That's all gone, apart from that red bit that shouldn't be there at all, should it? So I'm just going to do that shadow over there because having got rid of the swing, we need to get rid of, rid of the shadow of the swing. And what I'm going to do then is take it back to save it. And I have no idea why that red bit isn't disappearing. Would it disappear if we turned it off and on again? Oh, I've no idea what that is. It wasn't the pen, the pencil or the brush. But you get the idea. It's gone. It's gone. Completely gone. Right. OK, so we've done the in-painting. The in-painting is just amazing. Right. I'm going to carry on then and look at some selections because this is the one that you really asked me a lot about selections. You were interested in selections. I mean, the number one thing to select is hair and fur, isn't it? And I've got a great I've got three great demos here uh, of varying complexity. OK, I'm going to start off with Charlie, Charlie the camel. Charlie is a stock image. And I've got another stock image that I will be working with with Charlie. But this is Charlie. Right. What I'm going to do to start off with is uh, duplicate Charlie. So I have Charlie on the background as well as Charlie. And what I'm going to do is show you the selection tools to get to the selection tools. And the reason that this is difficult is if you look at the fur, you've got edges of fur there and there's blue behind it. And that's why it's a, a difficult selection. I mean, we can all make selections if it's got hard edges. If you're selecting a cardboard box, it's not difficult. You need to go into the selection persona. Having got in there, you have all these tools down the left hand side that will enable you to make selections. Because the background is so conveniently virtually one color, 
I can use this smart selection brush at the top and make it very big and start selecting just by drawing on it the blue bits. You saw how much that selected. You can see the marching ants. It made a bit of a mess of the selection though. It's uh, over selected. But we can fix that because you have a mode here and you can use the add to add to that selection. But I don't want to add to it because I'm trying to select the sky and it's got too much already. I want to take away from it. So I can change the mode to subtract and go in there and just drawing over the fur, I can take that selection back to the edge of the fur and I can do the same at the top. But no matter what I do with a selection brush, I am never going to get a great selection on there because just look at the edges of it. There's no way I could draw around that and select it. But by selecting the background, the blue bit, I enable myself to do something else, which is double tap. And this time, instead of going out, it gives me four options and I can invert the selection. If I invert the selection, the ants don't look any different, but I'm now not selecting the blue bit. I'm selecting Charlie. But it's still not the best selection. Not at all. You can tell that from here. What I need is another tool. And helpfully, we have down at the bottom here. So if I just tap and hold on that, you can see what all those tools are. We're looking at the refine selection tool. And this tool is amazing. This is going to be your friend. You are going to love it. And I'm going to tap on there. This takes me into a different mode, which is going to enable me to refine the edges of the selection I've already made. And you can see if I'd knocked this out and I'd put that on a background, I'd have all this blue from the sky. All of that would be showing because it's not really being excluded from the part of the selection. And I have the same problem with this. It's a huge, huge image that I'm asking it to do a lot of work on, a lot of calculations. But I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a go. And what I'm going to do is just start drawing over the edges. And when I do that, it has a calculation and it tidies up the selection. So you can see this bit here over on the right hand side has much less blue showing through than this bit next to it, which has def got definite blue tinges on it. So if I do the same again, just go over the edges. It will have another think about it and it will tidy that up. Having said that, this bit isn't the most difficult, is it? So if I just do that bit, I've done the easy bit. But when we come to look at this, this is a nightmare. There's fur there that you can see that is, um, if, you're, if you're looking at my camera where you can see me pointing, there's actually fur that's not selected at all. So what I'm going to try and do is just make a smallish selection. I'm just going to work on this bit here and I'm going to go round and select all of that. So I'm going over and above to just get in all of that fur. And it has made a much better selection of that. So I'm just going to carry on going around there and doing that. So just going over all of the edges. Now you can try this in one pass if you want, but I wouldn't if I were you. I found it works better if I do it in little bits. And we can see there he's got some fur just on the edge of his nose. And I'm going to go across his nose here. Do camels have noses? Is that his nose? Well, I think so. There we go. And that's all around his uh, um, eyelashes and eyebrows there. Go across the top up to his ear. So just going up to the top of his ear. And it's tidied up that. And now I've got another difficult bit, which is this bit here as we come down behind his ear and down the back of his neck that a lot of that is it's stuck out quite away from his body and there's a lot of blue in there. So I'm just going to go over it. As I say, I could do that more at a time, but it's quite difficult. So I'm giving Affinity at least a fighting chance of making a good selection there and not dying a sad death on me in the middle of a live session. <gasps> that would never do. OK, that bit's done. This bit's a lot easier because it's virtually straight. So I'll just go around there very quickly and that leaves the bit at the end here. So I'll just take it from there up to there and then finish it off. Going from that bit there right up the back there. And that's it. We have our selection. Now, I can see that it's better because there isn't as much blue showing. All right. But you're looking at it with what's called a ruby overlay. 
If I tap the overlay option at the bottom, you can change how that's displayed. So I can change it to black and you can see what that would look like against a black background. You can see there is no blue. So I'm going to go back and choose white. You can see on a white background, there is no blue. We've got rid of it all. You can see it on a transparent background. And my personal favorite, black and white, that shows you the selection that you have made. And you can see just how amazing, if I just tap on there, just how amazing that selection is. And it didn't take the usual years of practice. That's just an Apple pencil and drawing around it. OK, so that's my personal favorite to check how, how my selection looks. So I'm just going to take it back up to what you're probably going to work with, which is the overlay. Now, I need to do something with this. I can't just leave it sat here. I'm in the wrong mode at the moment. But on the output in the lower right hand corner, I can output the selection that I've made because remember, I'm in the selection persona and I'm making selections and I can output it as a selection, can output it as a mask, a new layer or my favorite, which is a new layer with a mask. And the reason why I would do that is the new layer with a mask would enable me to make changes after I can go in and edit the mask. So that's why I would choose that one and then tick, just hit the tick and out I go. And there is my camel, which he's grand, but he hasn't got a background now. So what I now want to do, and I'm just going to go out and save that lest we have any crises and go back into it. What I'm going to do now is go up to my menu and I'm going to choose place. And I'd like to place a document. And my document is in the cloud. It's in Charlie the camel. And it is a background an Egyptian background. So I'm going to load this in and where it's loading is it's loading into my pencil really or my finger. And to add it to this image, I just need to tap it and it brings the image in. Obviously, it's way too small, but I can just stretch it out. And I'm actually stretching that out with the pencil. And all I need to do is make sure that it's covering there. So it covers the background. Move it into place. I need to be a smidgen bigger. Perfect. OK, now, obviously, problem is can't see Charlie now. So I need to go back to the layers and you see that this image is at the top. I need to put it behind Charlie. Now there is Charlie and his friends. I think Charlie needs to be moved down a little bit, so I'm going to move him down here. But the problem is it's a little bit contrasting with the background. In fact, it's not contrasting enough. I can't really see either too well. So what I need to do is apply something to this. I need to do something to this. And what I need to do, I'm just going to duplicate it so I can go back if I need to. So just duplicate that background. And what I need to do with it is to go into the filters. And I said there were different filters and we looked at blurs. Here's some blurs. What we really need to do is blur out that background slightly. So I'm going to add some lens blur to it. OK. And what I need to do with that, I'm going to turn on the before and the after. And we're actually looking at that sarcophagus there. What I need to do is bring up these and you can see what's happening. The background is blurring. So if I cover one face, but not the other, I can change the thresholds and how much it blurs, in what way it blurs. I can change the curvature of the blur. I can do all kinds of things. But the biggest thing is this radius. Do you want it a little bit blurred or a lot blurred? I think somewhere in the middle is about right. So I can do a before and an after. Oh, Charlie looks much happier now. In fact, I think I'll, I'll make that a little bit blurred even more. So we've gone from there. It's now applying a blur to that layer. Or I should say it's thinking about it. There we go. It's done it. If I go back to my layers, that was what we had before the blur. And that's what we had after. And if you look at Charlie, there's no sky there. You can see all the way through his fur into the background. So you've recomposited that. OK, that was one. Right, I'm going to go back to here. I have two more that show you similar thing. But again, a lot of these images like Charlie was against the sky. And although it's impressive to be able to knock Charlie out of that image against that sky, um, it would be even more impressive if you'd taken an image that was a real image, a genuine image, you just snapped a photo. And that's what I did. 
This is about 12 years old. In fact, yeah, it must be at least 12 years old. You'll all laugh when I, when I explain why. And this was my boy. Isn't he amazing? Uh, this was Mike looking about 12. So I won't say he looks a little bit older yet, but he does look a little bit older. And that was my computer. It was a 14 inch monitor. Oh, wow. So this image definitely was not taken to have this done with. It absolutely definitely was not done for this. But it would be nice to be able to extract Maya from the garbage that is um, my MCSE textbooks at the back there. But it's a tricky one because um, he was a bit furry. He was very furry. So what I need to do with this is to go back into the selection persona and I need to make a basic selection. And I'm just going to roughly go around there and hopefully make a selection. Uh, we're in the subtract. We need to be into the add. So I need to uh, add my selection there. Are you making me a selection? Let me make sure that we can do that. Are you going to do this here? Oh, you're not, are you? Why aren't we doing this? You should definitely be doing that. I could do that on the other way. Oh, and there's me saying, isn't it marvellous when it works? And here it is, misbehaving. You saw it work on Charlie. It was exactly the same thing. Uh, what I'm going to do is duplicate that layer, see if that makes a difference. I need to go back to here, duplicate the layer. You're going you're gonna to play ball with me? Or are you just not playing with poor Maya? You're not, are you? You are not. Okay, what was my other one? Hmm. I can refine the selection, but we haven't... Oh, we have got a selection. You're just not showing it to me. It's a terrible selection. Oh, wow, that's appalling. Okay, I'm going to go back. Uh, I'm not seeing my selection. That's my problem. I am not seeing it. So uh, why aren't I seeing it? Right. I am going to uh, do a double tap and I'm going to deselect all. I'm going to have to do this blind. I seem to have lost uh, it showing me that I've got a selection. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, scribbling over Maya and hoping that it's making some kind of stab at a decent selection which I will be able to see when I go into my smart selection. I've seen better selections. Right, what I need to do here is alter this selection. And I'm going to tell you this worked marvellously in rehearsals. Uh, I'll just have to do it this way. Not much else I can do other than go around the edge like that and hope for the best. It would be nice if I could see my selection as well. So if you could just arrange that, that would be good. There we go. At least this way I can see my selection. And you are making a bit of a, as we say in England, town halls of that, aren't you? You're determined not to make that selection. Right. Let's go down there. Oh, the joy of live demos. I love it. I love it. That's not the best selection in the world either. OK. Hmm. Why aren't you behaving? Right. What I'm going to do, given mindful of the time, I will show you this one later. What I want to do is to go back and get a different image because this was the most difficult of the lot. Having said that, if it's not behaving at the moment, can you imagine with a more difficult one? But let's do this last one uh, if we can. Uh, where we go? This one was even more complicated. This one was the lady in the graveyard. Who remembers the lady in the graveyard? Uh, right. What I need to do here is to make a selection of this. So hopefully this one's going to behave itself more. Right, let's do a selection. Ah, oh, you see, you're working it. It's just Mayor it doesn't like tonight. OK, I'll do the Mayor one later and then you can see it. Right, I am selecting far too much there, so I need to get that brush right down. Um, I'm trying to select the background. So I need to lose all the stuff that isn't background by um, uh, subtracting it. But this one is, um, the Mayor one was good, but this one is amazing if I can get it to work. There we go. So I've got a very rough selection. Uh, I think when I did it, I went in here and, and tried to do a selection of the um, feather thing as well up there. Made a bit of a go of that and then tried tidying it up. Right. OK, so I need now to invert that selection. So I'm just selecting the lady, but it's not the best selection of the lady I've ever seen. Not at all. But the bit that we're going to be interested in, and this is the one that everybody said to me. The hair. I need to select hair. How do I select hair? Well, this is how you select hair. I'm going to go over a little bit here. And as I move down, you'll notice the interface gets out of the way. So that disappears. That's much better. So I'm going over the hair, including the grey bits in the background, which is the background. And going all the way over here up to there. 
Right, so it's making a good stab at that selection. I'll tidy up over there. She's just her arm. And it doesn't look bad at all. In fact, if I go into the overlay and I change it to black, it doesn't look a bad selection at all. But I'm going to show you by zooming in that that hat is actually porous. It's got holes in it. And it would be good if you could be able to see through it. But that's going to be tricky, isn't it? Because if we look at what that selection is by seeing this one, there is nothing showing through. You can see with the hair that it's showing through, but with this one, no. So I'm going to go back to my overlay and I am going to go over here like that. This is ambitious. This is very ambitious, but I'm going to do it anyway. Hey, it failed me on Maya. It better not fail me on this one. My poor boy. He's going to have to be done later, I'm afraid. Or he's going to be very upset. Right, so let's do that. Right, doesn't look like too much has changed there, to be honest. But if I go into that overlay, and I know I'm running very tight for time, aren't I? But it's so worth it. You can now see, instead of it being solid, it's actually made the most minute of selections in there. Oh, if we can get this working, this will be amazing. So I will output this. I will output it in the same way, a new layer with a mask. And hit the tick and we're out. We have the hat. We have some colours in it. We actually also have some holes in it, believe it or not. So for that to work well, we need to see what's behind it. We need to put something behind it. So I'm going to come out of it just so it saves. I do not want to lose that. And then I need to go in and I need to place a document. So I'm putting a document behind it. And this is where the graveyard came into it. Uh, because she looks quite dark and mysterious, doesn't she, in that outfit? Right, it's loaded it in. There's my graveyard. Way too big, but I'm going to take it down so it fits on there. And as long as it covers it top to bottom, that's fine. That'll do. Obviously, it's back to front. Uh, in terms of layers. So I need to take the lady and put her over the top. And what I need to do with the lady is we need to see that we can actually see through that hat. So I need to move her down. And as, as I move her down, you can see you can actually see the bird through the hat. You look there, you've actually got where you can see the bird in there. And the more time you take with this, the best, the better it will be. The absolute better it will be. You can also see we've got a great selection of the hair. There's no grey showing through there from the previous one. And the hat and everything else. So that hat is how you would select things like a wedding veil. So you can see through it. So as I move it round, you can actually see the background through that hat. And you can see the bird through that hat. The more time I take with that selection, the better that will be. But we have... Um, Oh, I think well, I've got more demos, but we've reached the end of our time, really. So how about we have another session? Would that work for everybody? So uh, let me just get back into my slides. Uh, where's my mouse pointer gone? You've been playing around all night, haven't you? Right. OK, so quick wrap up. If you find that you have edited an image in um, Affinity Photo and you take it back to your desktop and your desktop gives you a dirty message saying that it can't edit it, you need the beta version, the very latest version that has yet to be released in the App Store. And I've got a link that I will put in the chat that you can download that from. Uh, it's a problem that I had and it now works fantastically. So you will not have that problem if you use the beta version. If you are looking for more training, you will find on Vimeo that Affinity have their own tutorials and they are very, very good. So uh, do have a look at those on Vimeo. If you're interested in Affinity Photo for the desktop, the Mac version, I have um, a session that I delivered on YouTube. You can go to my YouTube channel and uh, you can find the recording. It was from an earlier version of Affinity. So um, if you're interested in more Affinity, I can do that. So just let me know. And other than that, contact me if you have questions. I know I have questions that I will be coming out to. But if you think of anything after the event, you can contact me on all of those. Although, to be honest, I'm not great on... Um, oh, and app.net's gone, hasn't it? But never mind that. Um, I'm not great on Google+. Plus. They keep changing it and I can't keep up with it. But I'm there on LinkedIn, Facebook and Twitter particularly, so you can find me there. But I'm going to head off into Q&A.